Okay, now I've got two things in my hand, which is kind of complicated. Um, so, welcome to Blockchain Week. It's excited to have so many people in San Francisco, my hometown. Um, so I'm here to talk about a slightly different conversation point. I'm going to give you some examples of how we've been looking at the world and talk a little bit about a solution that we've been working on to try and really uh, change things. So William Gibson gave this great quote, um, quite famous now. He says, the future's already here, it's just in unevenly distributed. And normally people look at this and they say, oh, this is great, I'm going to live forever, I'm going to upload my brain to the metaverse, everything's going to be really cool. But, but there's kind of another way to look at this. Uh, Nico Sell gave a great talk a few years ago in the Oslo Freedom Forum where she talks about the rise of surveillance capitalism. And I think if you have been paying attention, you remember things like Russia shutting down Telegram. They didn't just shut down Telegram, they actually shut down a huge section of the internet, blocked like a huge number of IP addresses. And this is an example of uh, the protests that actually happened in Russia once Telegram was shut down. Moving over to China, you've got this situation in China where um, the surveillance capitalism and surveillance state moving in such a fast pace now. This is a, what's called a social credit score. So basically your ability to send your kids to college, get on the plane, basically live your life as you'd expect to in a democracy is now subject not to credit scores based on whether or not you just pay off your debts on time, although there are actually now uh, billboards with people who aren't paying their debts off, but also the kind of posts that you like, the kind of friends that you have. And coming back to home, poor old Mark uh, found out recently um, what happens when you do mess with people's data, when you don't tell the truth about what you're doing with it, or when you don't take good enough care of it. <clears throat> so, What's happening here? Well, I believe that the culture that we're creating is a function of the architecture that we're using. Uh, this photograph on the left-hand side of your screen is what's called a panopticon, which is an idealized prison uh, architected in the late 1800s um, from a home country, England. We're good at this stuff. And uh, the, um, the Panopticon essentially was a place where the prisoner had no idea whether they're being watched at any point in time. So after a while, if you don't know if you're being watched, you behave as if you are. And this is bringing back to the real world here. Uh, this region of China, uh, which is predominantly Islamic, um, has such high surveillance, both physical um, and electronic, that in the end, people are just behaving as if they're being surveilled at any point in time. So kind of taking a step back here, so what is data today? Data is uh, really the new natural resource. And surveillance is this mechanism to own and control it. I highly recommend uh, many of uh, Yuval Harari's books. Um, Sapiens is incredible, and his new book, uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And he really drives home this point that at this point in time in history, when we think about dictatorships from the past, when we think about communism, when we think about fascism, one of the biggest challenges is when you're trying to control a population in a central way is really managing the data. And now everyone here is like, well, that's, that's easy now. You just have big data and AI and everything's cool. So it's actually much more efficient right now to build a dictatorship than a democracy. And you'll see the challenges we have in you know, liberal democracies of actually even holding a democracies. So I think just because, one, one thought might leave you here, is just because something feels like it's the right thing to do, liberal democracies, et cetera, doesn't mean necessarily it's gonna be the right thing or gonna be the thing that happens. We may actually fall into something quite different. And so whoever controls this data controls your future, your future. So I like to think about this as really we're entering this choice. It's not kind of existential choice. The two extremes, one of which I've really explained a little bit so far as surveillance capitalism um, and surveillance by the state. And the other one is this really scary thing where everything's open, anonymous, there's no control, all the things that we're hearing many companies talk about today. And most people are terrified about this idea. But I'll give you another idea. It's like, well, what if the internet's the last place you could be private? 
And this picture is uh, of closed circuit TV cameras. Um, again, in my home country in London, uh, there are actually more closed circuit TV cameras per person than anywhere else in the world. So you're going to be monitored, you're going to have face recognition, you're going to have all sorts of stuff, you're going to have social networks. But couldn't we just have one place where you could have a private conversation or express yourself? So how do we restore this idea? How do we think about the internet and, and also trying to think about the internet as not a separate place, but a place that we all live in today? Our real world and our virtual world are actually essentially the same at this point. And the digital natives, the people who grew up with the internet and don't think of it as this new country, they already embody this idea. So we believe, as in common with many of you here, is you have to distribute the underlying architecture. And I'm, as usual, ahead of time, but uh, <laughs> I'm now gonna dig in a little bit into what we're doing. Um, so with Orchid, uh, we are really trying to focus on how we do this and build a framework, not just for a specific application, but for developers to build upon these ideas. <clears throat> the basic architecture of our system is essentially an overlay network, and we've architected it in a way that it's resistant to many different kinds of attacks. Um, as a popular example, does anyone remember the denial of service attacks on Ethereum a few years ago? Anybody? Well, there was one last year, it was called CryptoKitties. <laughs> but there was actually one a couple of years ago which was a malicious attack. Um, and so I find it interesting, and I'm not going to knock Ethereum all day because I have a lot of respect for the team and um, friends there, but on that specific network, which many people are now basing their companies and investments on, it's susceptible to a very simple attack. It's a denial of service attack. And if you manage to do that, then the network just shuts down. And when we talk about scaling issues, we're actually talking about security issues because when you launch an application on there that can take up too many resources, it effectively DDoSes itself. So what can we do on top of this system? Uh, what can we build on this? Well, first of all, secure, secure communications. Uh, we tend to think a lot about um, messengers, the way we communicate with one another, and I definitely have different modes of communication on Facebook Messenger than I have on Signal. We're gonna be building secure communications platforms on here. We're looking for developers to build many different things. Uh, social networks, I think, is a fascinating example today, especially given what's happened with Facebook. Um, and our first application is going to actually be essentially a VPN-like client that allows people in any country to access any content. I think I'm about five minutes ahead of schedule, but maybe that's good for the organizers. Um, so just going back to William Gibson's quote, it's kind of like just rewrite this. The future is already here, we just need to distribute it. Thank you.